his praises, I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, come, come. Let us together tell of the goodness of God and his greatness. Let us exalt his name together. Amen. Amen. Good evening, Highland Park. Those of us who are in the sanctuary, those of us who are in our cyberspaces, good evening. I greet you in the mighty, the matchless, the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we give God a hand clap of praise on tonight? He's been mighty good. All weekend long, he kept us. This morning, he woke us up, amen, and he brought us to this place safely that we might acknowledge and praise and worship him, amen. So he deserves all of our praise. All glory is to his name. Amen. 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 We greet our pastor who is with the men on this evening. Um, and we pray for their success in their Bible study on tonight. Amen. God is everywhere. He's blessing all of us all the time. Amen. Amen. We're going to move forward with our program on this evening. Um, the Women's Ministry of the First Baptist Church of Highland Park presents She Is Called. Amen. So we're going to learn something about women who followed Jesus on tonight. Amen. So we'll move forward with our program on this evening. Um, we will have our scripture reading by Sister Princina Simpkins, followed by our prayer by Reverend Cheryl McNeil. and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. May God's people be blessed by the hearing of his word. closer to you and we will be more willing and more able and have the strength to do what it is you have purposed each of us to do. God, help us to use our talents, Lord God, the ones that you have given us. Help us to get up from the table, Lord God. We know who you are. We have supped with you. We have spent time with you. And so now, Lord, we ask you to 
guide us this evening. Help us to know what it is you would have us to know to, on tonight. We thank you, God, for this opportunity. We ask that your Holy Spirit move throughout this place. Lord, not just in this sanctuary, but in the sanctuary adjoining us, that all of us as men and women of God will be the ones who stand up and allow everyone to see God in our lives and working in our lives. Help us that we will be the kind of individuals that people will look at us and want to know what it is that we have, Lord God, and give us that opportunity to share it with them that we may lift up the name of Jesus. It is in Jesus' precious name that we pray these prayers and we count them as done because we know that you are a God who will answer the prayers of his people. In his precious name, amen. Thank you so much, Sister Simpkins, for that uh, scripture reading and Reverend Cheryl McNeil for that fervent prayer. We want to honor our First Lady, Dr. Wefta Noma Carter Davis. If she is in the house and if she is now, we honor her in her absence. Amen. We want to do things decent and in order. Um, next, we will have a musical selection by um, our wonderful singer and our musicians on this evening. God bless you. The Spirit of the Lord is certainly in this place, and we thank you for ushering in the Spirit of God. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercies never fail me all my days.
praising him. We are gathered as women. We can't praise him for ourselves. We can praise him for our children. We can praise him for our grandchildren. We can praise him for our nieces and our nephews, our aunts and our uncles. Come on and praise him. He's been mighty good. There's stuff we go through on behalf of other people when we're not taking care of ourselves, but we worried about somebody else. Come on. always for our good. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Amen. 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 Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. It's all right. Thank you. God is good. We don't know what our sister next to us is going through. We can pray for him anyway. Amen. God is so good. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. So I can't do this like Pastor Davis would do it. But I can at least say the words. It's offering time. <laughs> Amen. So our ushers are available. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. The ways to give are certainly on our screen on this evening. And as they come forward, and as you're preparing, for those of us who will be using our electronic devices, if you would hold them in the air, let us pray. God, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy, for your presence in this place on tonight, oh God, for your covering that just falls down fresh on all of us on this evening, God. We thank you for those who will be able to give on tonight, and we thank you for those who are not able, God. We pray that you would continue to bless and keep each and every one of us, that our gifts and our offerings fall on fresh soil, nurtured soil, soil that is ready to produce for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. And we all say together, amen.
honored task to introduce our presenter for this evening. And you have in your programs tonight her bio. I'm going to read through that. Um, but also I want to point out on the back is space for notes. And I could tell you from experience, having sat under her tutelage at Howard University, you will need a pen and your note pages, amen. So real quickly, let me read her bio. Dr. Cheryl J. Sanders is professor of Christian ethics at Howard University School of Divinity and senior pastor of the Third Street Church of God in Washington, DC. Her many publications include several books, Ministry at the Margins, Saints in Exile, Empowerment Ethics for a Liberated People, and an edited volume, Living the Intersection. She is a graduate of Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C., has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Mathematics from Swarthmore College, and she holds two degrees, Master of Divinity and Doctor of Theology from Harvard Divinity School. She is a member of the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Christian Ethics, and serves two terms as president of the American Theological Society. She is a former board member of the Association of Theological Schools and currently serves on the ATS Council on Theological Scholarship and Research. She recently joined the editorial board of studies in the Holiness and Pentecostal Movements, a book series published by Penn State University Press. She serves as the at, she serves the Church of God, um, Anderson, Indiana, as a member of the Board of Elders of the Chesapeake, Delaware, Potomac District of the Church of God, and as Vice Presiding Elder of the National Association of the Church of God based in West Middlesex, Pennsylvania. She mentors pastors and candidates for ministry for her denomination and is an advocate for women in ministry. She is married to Dr. Alan Carswell, and together they are parents of two adult children, Allison and Garrett. Be prepared to be blessed on tonight, uh, professor extraordinaire and preacher. And I'm sure you will experience both on this evening. Please help me welcome Dr. Cheryl Sanders. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Boyd. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to return to First Baptist Church Highland Park. So thankful for your women's ministry, thankful for your pastor and first lady. And I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, several uh, persons in the congregation who have been students at Howard University School of Divinity. So glad to be in the house of the Lord, the place where Jesus is lifted up. And so we have already had an extraordinary worship experience tonight. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity, the invitation, seriously, um, to share uh, with the women of Highland Park Church. Um, we, we have uh, women's ministry at Third Street Church of God, and this happens to be our women's week. Uh, we're having uh, various activities every day of the week leading up to our Women's Day on Sunday, to which you all invited, or you can watch us on a live stream. But I'm just going to invite the women of Third Street, if you would stand or raise your hand so we can celebrate uh, the, the ladies who have come. So thankful for Third Street Church of God and for our ministry to, for, and about women. So we're going to go to the screen. And, well, maybe we're not. Um, there it is. Okay, women who followed Jesus. Women who followed Jesus, yes. Um, our, our theme tonight, she is called women who followed Jesus, and um, the, the scripture text that is before you has already been read, 
It's already been read. But um, I just want to make a few comments about it while, we're, while we have these words before us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I want to begin by drawing your attention to the fact that among the disciples, among the followers of Jesus, were men and women. There were many women who followed Jesus. And they may not have had the same title or recognition that the 12 apostles had. But even if you think about the 12 apostles, I don't know how many of us could really name all 12 of them. Now, we know Peter, we know John, <laughs> we know Andrew, but there were few of them who, shall we say, made a name for themselves. The scripture tells us a lot about them. Uh, but we really don't know what each and every one. Judas was the one who betrayed him. Uh, we know his name. But the Bible gives us the names of some of the women, but there were more women than who get named. Among the many women who followed Jesus, in Luke chapter 8, we have three of them named, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna. Now, we know more about Mary Magdalene than we know about any of the others. And we really don't, we only hear Susanna's name is mentioned only one time. Joanna and Mary Magdalene also visited the empty tomb on Easter morning. And Joanna and Mary Magdalene were among the women who were told to take a message to the men, and the men did not believe them. We know that one of these women, Joanna, had a husband who worked for the Herod administration. He worked for the government. And we don't know if that meant that they had a certain status or income. We just know that her husband was Herod's administrator. What we do know, and this is very important because this is a one fact that establishes the continuity from the New Testament to the present day. What we do know is that these women gave money to ministry. Where would the church be today without the financial support of women? What I want you to see in verse 3, it clearly says, now you, you may have a different translation than what's up there. They provided financial support for Jesus and his disciples. In other words, they didn't just support Jesus personally. They supported the ministry. So they followed Jesus, and, and the Bible says here, I want to stay with, stay with this, these three verses. Jesus traveled from city to city, village to village. He had an urban itinerant ministry. This is where, where the people were. People were in the villages and the towns and the cities, so that's where Jesus went. He traveled constantly. The women went with him to these places, but when you travel, you have expenses. When you minister, you have expenses. And the Bible says that these women not only went, but they brought money and they gave money. And they supported Jesus and his disciples. The other thing that we will see about these women is that they had an experience being ministered to 
by Jesus. It says, they have been cured from evil spirits and various illnesses. Don't overlook that. Simply because, it's just a simple comparison. I'm, I'm not tr trying to say the women are e any better or worse than the men. I'm not trying to say that. But we don't get a testimony of healing from any of the men. We just don't know. Maybe, maybe they were healed, but the Bible doesn't say. These women were healed, and they told somebody. They had a testimony of being delivered. They had a testimony of being healed. And so it was part of their rationale for being a part of the ministry. They had benefited from the ministry, so they were giving back. Their giving back, next slide, please, can be summarized in three different characteristics of these women, of their ministry. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking my time with this because I want you to see how this is so relevant to the ministry of women and men today. What we know about these women is that they were doing good. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, has a beautiful summary of the ministry of Jesus. That God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. That's a one-verse summary of the whole ministry of Jesus. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He had the power. He went about doing good. There's no point in having anointing and power if you're not doing anybody any good. The goodness, he was doing good. He was helping people. He was healing people. He was making people feel good about their future, about themselves. He did them good. And so he didn't just go places because he liked to travel. Some of us like to travel. We like to see new things and eat new foods and see the do sightseeing. That's all good. Jesus traveled because he wanted to find some people who needed some good in their life that he was able to provide to help people feel good after being relieved of pain in their bodies. People who were harassed by the devil, oppressed by the devil, their minds and their emotions, that they felt good about themselves as a result of meeting Jesus, touching Jesus, knowing Jesus, hearing Jesus, being taught by Jesus, being motivated and moved by Jesus. Jesus did them a lot of good. The power of the Holy Spirit did them good when Jesus touched them and taught them the truth. Jesus gave the people hope. Jesus gave the people a reason to strive. He gave him, them a reason to believe a reason to put their faith and their trust in God. And so these women were active participants in a ministry that was focused on doing good. Goodness is a trait of character that gives priority to meeting the needs of others. The fruit of the Spirit. You familiar with Galatians chapter 5? Verse 22, we got a whole list of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness. It's in the list. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Doing people good. 
the good. It's not that you're better than anyone. It's just that you want to make things better rather than make them worse. Goodness means it's not all about me, but what can I do to bring some light, to bring some joy, to bring the peace and the long suffering. All that is doing good. It's good behavior. Goodness motivates your desire to do good deeds that benefit others. So these women partner with Jesus in doing good. But they also did Jesus some good in a direct way. And that was their generosity. The people, the people of God, as a rule, as a general rule, are generous people. They're people who don't mind giving. People who are not selfish. The Bible says they provided financial support for Jesus and his disciples. That means they gave money. They didn't just go along for the ride. They didn't just count the money, hold the money, spend the money. They gave the money needed to finance the ministry. So the generosity of the women disciples provided direct financial assistance to Jesus and the male disciples. Now, we do get some instances, more than one, where the women, where the men complained about what was being done with the money. And so here we have the testimony that the women gave money, but there there's no evidence that they disputed over how the money was spent. And so here's my point. It's one thing to give money and it's strings attached. You give because you think it's going to give you some say or some influence or you're going to impress somebody with what you gave. That's not, this isn't that kind of giving. This is giving where I give it to you and I let it go. Yeah. Not trying to control anybody. That was, see, we, 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 when we read the Gospels, Judas came to no good end, but he was the treasurer. And so he was the first one to complain about, he held the money. You remember with the woman with the alabaster box? And he complained, this was a waste. We could have sold this and used the money. He complained about the money. We don't know if he ever put a nickel in the bag. These women gave. They were generous. And they invested good money in good work. Good money. It's an investment, really. When, when you get, when, when giving gets good to you, it's an investment. You're investing. In other words, it's like planting the seed. How often does the Bible tell us about you plant the seed, you expect a harvest. Now, if you don't plant any seed, don't, don't be expecting a harvest. Many people expect a harvest. They ain't planted one seed. But you plant the seed, then the Lord will give the harvest. And so these women were planting, 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 investing in the ministry. Third characteristic that inspires us in our discipleship today was their gratitude. They were grateful. They were thankful. You remember that Jesus healed ten lepers? It was ten of them. One! The other nine just went on their merry way. Oh, I'm here. Oh, yeah. All okay, right. Got something to do. One went back and said, thank you. Well, looks like here all of these women went back and said, thank you. They had gratitude in their hearts when they met Jesus. He had set them free and they joined him in doing good works. Good news. They gave and they sustained ministry. They were grateful and they showed it. 
Next slide. I'll show you an image. I, um, I don't know if you can make that out. This is an Ethiopian painting. You know, Ethiopia is the um, part of Africa that has the most ancient tradition of Christianity. Far, way before any European missionaries set foot on the continent of Africa, the people in Ethiopia and in Egypt, the Coptic church in Egypt, they, 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 they knew Jesus, worshiping Jesus. And uh, so I don't know if you, if you can make out that image, but it's an artist's rendition of taking Jesus down from the cross and laying him in the tomb. And I just want you to focus on that. I'll share a scripture that when Jesus was on the cross, Matthew 27, many women, verse 55, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had always supported him. See, it's, there it is again. The women followed him, and the women supported him. There it is again. Among them were Mary from Magdala, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And so in that, uh, well, in that picture that's no longer up there, um, I wanted you to see there's, there's a, one of the um, scenes is uh, the you can only tell the difference. There's a beard on the men. And the men are taking him down. The men are laying him in the tomb. But the women are there in all of those scenes. It's men and women attending to the dying, the death, and the burial of the Lord Jesus. And we, we can go to the, uh, to the next slide. After they laid him in the tomb, Mark 16, verse 9, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Not one of the twelve, not Peter, not John, not James, but Mary Magdalene. The one out of whom he had cast seven demons. Now, we don't get the account of Mary Magdalene and those seven demons. Don't know if they all of them came out at one time or if Jesus had to keep working with her to get all those demons out of her. But she had a testimony. And because of her relationship with Jesus, she was freed from the oppression of the demonic. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Oh, that demon-possessed woman. We don't have to listen to her. Or she don't know what she's talking about. She lost her mind. Oh, or that's a woman. We don't have to. Oh, one, of the, one of the words the Bible uses, uh, these are idle tales. They don't have anything better to do, so they're just making stuff up. They said all kinds of things. And all she was doing was reporting to them what she had seen, what she had heard, and who she knew. Because she knew Jesus. She knew Jesus in her release. She knew Jesus in her healing. She knew Jesus in her testimony. And nobody could take that away from her. That's what gave credibility to her, even if the people didn't believe her. And so I have another picture. I got now this uh, next picture um, is just a, a, a more recent artist, artist uh, rendition of when Jesus appeared to Mary, he appeared first to Mary. He called her 
by her name to make sure that she recognized him. Because you, you, know, you know how that story goes. Mary, there was this man, and she thought he was the gardener. She did not recognize him. But as soon as he called her name, she was Rabboni, teacher. She immediately recognized him. He gave her a message to share, a report of the good news. He gave her a message so that the men who were not, they were very, very fearful and they were cowering and they were hiding and they had locked themselves behind closed doors. He gave her a message, a good report of good news. Jesus gave that to her. She was called and sent by Jesus with a word. So I don't know how we get the idea that a woman cannot be called to preach. And I know there are many churches in different denominations that to this day, in the last time I checked was the 21st century, don't believe that women, oh, they believe only men, for some reason, only men, women can't do this, and women can't do that, and women can't do this and that. But I don't know what they do with, with this. How, how do we do Easter without the testimony of the women? How do we preach about him raising up from the early in the morning? How do we do that and not acknowledge that Jesus first, first, maybe she was the one who had the most presence with him because the rest of them was kind of hiding. But she had been there at the foot of the cross. She watched as they buried him. And she was there when the empty tomb was discovered. She had been very present. And so she was the first. And Jesus told her, gave her a message. Now, this is what I want you to tell me. Next slide is, this is, well, this is just a, just a depiction of it. To go to my brothers and sisters, but you know it's really the brothers. Go to the brothers. And tell him, I'm going to my father and your father to your, my God and to your God. Jesus gave her, entrusted her with a specific thing to say. Do you, when, when any of us, male or female, if, if you have a vocation, a call to ministry, the basis of that is that you figured out how to listen to God. Because if you're not listening to God, what are you saying? If you have a message to share, it's because you've heard it. You don't have a way of listening to God unless you've got a relationship with God. And so Mary had the relationship. She had the credibility so that Jesus could trust her. Even if People didn't believe her. Jesus trusted her. And she took that message. She was faithful to share the message. Sometimes as preachers, you get discouraged if you don't like the way people receive you. Sometimes you flunk, so they just looking at you cross that, like, when are you going to sit down and be quiet? <laughs> Sometimes they don't, they don't get what you're trying to say. Because you, preaching, I mean, you're a human being. And so people may not always respond or accept what you're saying, but your job is not to make them accept it. Your job is to be faithful to what God told you to do. So Mary is faithful. 
And she didn't have to say too much. All she had to say was, I have seen the Lord. That's all she had to say. That's where you get messed up sometimes. The Lord told you to say something, and you saying all this other stuff that the Lord ain't tell you to say. All she had to say was, I have seen the Lord. And then she could just, we all figure out what to do next. But I have seen the Lord. But the other part of that was, and the Lord is getting ready to show up. And y'all going to be talking about, I don't know what I'm saying. And the Lord is going to come right in the midst of you, which is what happened. So always get this. Ministry is always about preparing people to meet the Lord. That's why God sends preachers. That's why God calls people. That's why God sends people so that people will be prepared to meet the Lord. And so the men weren't ready. They, they didn't know what was going to happen. She was just helping them to get ready. The Lord is going to show up, and y'all sitting here talking about, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about, and you don't believe it, but I'm just trying to help you get ready. Be ready, because when the Lord shows up, there will be no more discussion. Because the Lord is nothing but the truth. So you may not like what I got to say, but get ready for the face-to-face with the Lord Jesus Christ. Next slide. Mary Magdalene's testimony, her tears, her trauma. Her tears, there's a lot of tears. Seems like every time we see Mary Magdalene, she's crying. Her tears taught her not to be afraid how to show how deeply she cared. Some people, you know, oh, oh, don't cry, don't cry. No, she was, she, she, she let the tears flow because she cared. And that was, that was a positive thing. That, that showed that she was present. She was all in. So her tears were not something to be ashamed of. But her tears reinforced the message of her presence and her compassion. Her trauma. Now, I've said to you, she had seven demons. She was traumatized by the devil. We don't know all of the ways that manifested. We just know that this woman had experienced deep trauma, but her trauma taught her that no matter how many times or how badly the devil harassed her, that Jesus had freed her to walk in victory and hope, be full of the grace of giving back. Sometimes people are traumatized like they just start like they paralyzed. She was traumatized. But her healing gave her a certain kind of compassion, a certain kind of gratitude, a certain kind of generosity because she never forgot where she came from. She was not trying to be better than somebody else. She was just trying to be grateful, but the Lord set me free and gave me space. And gave me hope. Jesus loved her to life and ministry. She had been traumatized, but she was full of grace. You know, grace, by the way, we have all kinds of different definitions of grace, but grace, when all is said and done, is the ability to do God's will. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why the demonic influences close in on people is that the devil doesn't want you to do anything for God. And even the memory of trauma can just stop us in our tracks. But Jesus set her free 
free from the criticism, free from the shame, free from the stigma, and free to speak the word and to share her testimony. Almost done. One, another little uh, drawing I want to show you. That's her announcing. That's Mary in the, right there in the red. I have seen the Lord. So she's telling everybody, this is my testimony. I have seen the Lord. I have, testimony is so much better when it's true. <laughs> when it's true. I've seen the Lord. I don't care what y'all say. I have seen the Lord. And so she was telling, she was giving him a heads up. I've seen the Lord. Guess what? He getting ready to come right in this space. And y'all better be ready to receive him. Can you see where that's still a part of what we're supposed to be doing in ministry? Not just talking about when Jesus make, makes his final return, but Jesus shows up. When the power and the praise and the preaching and the testimony goes forth, when people are being healed, when people are being saved, it's only because Jesus has shown up. That's why we call on the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is present with us. Mary Magdalene witnessed to the disciples. She had a message for his followers. Even those, remember Thomas, doubting Thomas? Thomas was like, okay, unless I see the wound, I am not. He just refused to believe. He made a point of rationalizing his doubt. But what happens is, that once he sees the Lord, then, of course, all of his doubts disappear. And so there's a blessing when you can receive what is spoken and not just what you see. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. And so the Lord helps us out by sending us a word, sending us a preacher, sending us a teacher, sending us a word that we can even read and meditate on on our own. God sends us what we need to reinforce the witness of his reality in our lives. She witnessed to them. She warned them before Jesus showed up. And when Jesus showed up, when he came in the room, he brought them a message of peace. And my last image is Jesus in the room. He comes with a message of peace. And my sisters, that is still our assignment, is to speak the word to give our testimony with or without the tears, but to tell the truth. Because when Jesus comes, Jesus comes with peace. Peace for our mind, peace for our soul, peace, our bodies are at peace. In his presence there is peace. And we need peace. We need peace in the church. We need peace in the streets, in the city. This urban itinerant ministry, ministry the, the, the villages, the suburbs, the cities, there's so much strife, so much violence. The blessing of peace is going to come when the people of God are willing to speak the name of Jesus. We're willing to tell the testimony of healing, the testimony of transformation, the testimony of salvation, the testimony of reconciliation. When we will speak the truth about Jesus, Jesus will show up and bring us peace. And may the peace of the Lord be with you. 
as you hear that vocation in your space, in your way. Everybody's not going to be a preacher in the pulpit. But tell the truth wherever you are so that people will know that Jesus has shown up for you. And Jesus will use our testimony to be a blessing of peace in a world that sorely, we need peace internationally. This planet needs peace. This nation needs peace. These churches need peace. These neighborhoods need peace. Our families need peace. Our schools need peace. It's a testimony of peace that we will only come when somebody has the courage to tell the truth that Jesus is real and that Jesus will make a difference to call on the name of Jesus. You know, some of the people, the politicians say, oh, they took prayer out of the school, prayer out of the school. But you can't take Jesus out of the school. And you can't take peace out of the school. And you can't take healing out of the school as long as there's someone who's there to be a witness. So be a witness. Be a witness. Be a witness. Thank God for the women who followed the call to be disciples. God bless you. Show me how to turn the thing on in the beginning. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Let's give God a hand. God is good all the time. And did we hear what we're supposed to do? We have our assignment. We need to open our mouths and tell whoever we can what God has done for us. Now, that's assuming that he's done something. <laughs> All right? <laughs> if we don't know who Jesus is, we don't have no testimony. Because the scripture says, you, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father he will do. We need Jesus. My responsibility tonight is to say to you, that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the perfect time for you to accept him as your Savior. And this goes for those who are in cyberspace, online, as well as people who are right here. You know, the assumption is generally, I started to say always, but generally, that the people who are sitting in the building are people who already know Jesus. That is not a good assumption. Because people come to the building, trying to get away from that light, people come to the building for years. For years. They don't know Jesus. People work in the church, they have positions, and they don't know Jesus. <laughs> And I have a testimony about that. I used to be a Sunday school teacher for years before I knew the Lord. I was doing the kids' homework with them when they came to Sunday school. Isn't that terrible? That's awful. I was an usher. And the only reason I was ushering, I'm just going to tell you, was so I could be standing up. <laughs> Isn't that pitiful? That's the truth. So nobody can tell me that everybody in the church is saved. 
all right? Nobody can tell me that. So I'm giving you an opportunity tonight to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I don't care what kind of whatever you've done in the church. This is a time to be honest with yourself and God. This is a time to be honest with yourself and God. God is waiting for you because Christ died that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And if you know you need Jesus, just come on to the front and we will pray with you and lead you to Christ. Is there anyone here tonight? Is there anyone tonight? All right. So what that means is if nobody comes, it's all for me. Because I've given you the opportunity. And it's between you and God. But if we're all believers in Jesus Christ, let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. And now, if there's nothing else to claim our attention, I don't know if anyone has a question or anything you would like to ask us. Dr. Sanders, does anyone have any question you'd like to ask her before we go? I think we might have a minute or so. Any questions? All right. Okay. Then it's time for the benediction. And now, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a good evening.